First, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, it's such an interesting group of people we have here with so many diverse interests and all focused on, on this, this form of education, financial and economic education. Uh, the American Institute for Economic Research has been around for almost 80 years. Next year will be 80 years. Uh, and our mission is, is so well aligned to this. Uh, it's, 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 it's fascinating. Uh, our founder was a, uh, a professor at uh, MIT and uh, he was there during the Great Depression. And uh, he was uh, appalled by uh, the, the experience of Americans, the way they were suffering during the Great Depression. And he felt that uh, with better education about financial matters that they could be doing much better in those times. And so that was one of the, the cornerstones of, of his thinking was that we, we need to provide better financial education to the public. The second thing was that, as you may remember, uh, the country was sort of blindsided. We, we didn't have all the agencies in place that we have now. We weren't collecting all the data. So we didn't know this was coming until people started jumping out of, of uh, sky, skyscraper windows, uh, although I hear that really didn't happen so much. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, we were hit by much surprise. And so the government started to collect data. And uh, our founder, Colonel Harwood, uh, realized that just having data wasn't enough. You have to have some interpretation of the data, some analysis, and the public needs someone who can do that, that they can trust, that doesn't have a corporate interest, doesn't have a government interest, uh, who doesn't spend doctor, who isn't partisan, who just gives the facts. And so he took these two ideas to the, the president of MIT, who thought it was a uh, pretty good idea, and the institute was born. And some 80 years later, here we are still doing the same thing, trying to educate the public and provide unbiased information. And obviously, uh, we, were, we were made for these times. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough time out there. Uh, one of the, the, the uh, central ideas that we have here at the Institute, because we're not trying to uh, spin doctor or push an agenda, is we're trying to truly provide education. And we believe that if financial literacy is to fulfill its promise, then it, it can't mean just uh, providing a fixed uh, group of skills uh, or providing uh, a fixed set of conclusions, but rather it, it requires helping people how to think about uh, financial and economic matters. So they have to learn how to reason about these things. Uh, I had a, a Chinese teacher at one point who told me that the, the secret to teaching was to help people on their way without choosing their destination. And that's really what we try to do. We try to, to teach, to, to provide the tools, the framework for analysis, and let people make their own decisions. There is a, uh, a well-known book by uh, Robert uh, Fulgham entitled, uh, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Uh, with all due respect, I think a lot of what we need to know these days uh, you need to learn in an economics class, and I, and I hope to make, uh, make that case today for you. Um, you see, economics is a system of logic. It's a system of applied logic. It's designed specifically to enable us to make decisions, uh, to sort out uh, facts and make decisions about financial matters. In fact, it provides uh, an insight into uh, other arrangements involving anything of value. Economists are Social scientists, uh, we see society through the lens of people relating to one another and to society through exchanges of things of value. That's, that's our, our lens into society. And of course, financial economics is one of the most direct applications of this. Um, economics is a social science and finance is as much about people as about money. And I think that is uh, something that is lost on a lot of people who, as they try to find their way in this, this complicated subject. Uh, transactions essentially form relationships, and they are a form of communication. It's the way we relate to one another. So when people buy, sell, contract, receive services, including financial intermediation, uh, any kind of transaction for things they value, this is economics. So it's, it's wrongheaded to, to fear or dislike economics uh, or finance because you think it's about money or greed. I think this is one of the first lessons we have to get across. Uh, you have to forget dime store economics and Gordon Gecko announcing that greed is good. Uh, that's Hollywood. That's, that's not the real thing. Economics is a social science and it only makes one assumption is that people have purpose. People try to do something. 
if they didn't have purpose, if there wasn't something guiding what they do, then it wouldn't be much of a social science. I don't know what you could hope to learn about people if they just operated randomly. At the university level, all finance majors are required to take basic courses in economics before they engage in any, any uh, of their basic core work in finance. So I think that's true not only, that should be true not only at the university level, but more broadly. I'd say it's true for anyone who seeks true financial literacy. So to demonstrate this, I want to talk about uh, some potential program competencies for financial uh, education. And I, I want to talk about how economics addresses these. And to do this, I'm going to uh, draw on some of my experiences as a, as a teacher, as an economist, and as a person who has some, some skill in, e in economics and finance who just lives and breathes and functions in the same real world that you do. One of the basic elements of financial literacy has to be an understanding of how markets work and how prices are formed. And of course, this is certainly the realm of, of economics. An understanding of the factors that influence supply and demand and prices uh, are critical to making better business decisions. Uh, supply and demand are, are some of the most basic elements. Uh, the applications are many. Uh, let me talk about demand, first of all. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you in. I think we can get away with this. He won't tell if I tell this story. I'm going to let you in on the, the, the dirty underbelly of economics. So I don't want to hear this on the evening news, OK? <laughs> when I was at the Fed, uh, we had to report to Congress periodically. And we had to go to the uh, Senate Finance Committee and uh, have our semi-annual Humphrey Hawkins hearing and talk about the Fed's plans. That's not what this is about. What this is about is, is that my first, my first uh, meeting, my first Humphrey Hawkins, I noticed there was a lot of scurry of activity at the Fed. And I thought this was a pretty fascinating thing. I didn't realize it was going to be such a big affair. And then we, uh, we all piled in the cars and the limos and headed up the hill. And we were going to have the, the hearing. I'm still not seeing what the big to-do is about. Alan Greenspan did his thing. It seemed like it was all very good. And then afterwards, that was when the real event occurred. I found out that Mrs. Fields' cookies is right across the street from the White House. And we were, the whole, all the, all the flurry of activity was everybody knew that when we went up the hill, we were going to go by Mrs. Fields on the way back. <laughs> you know, to, to, to sort of paraphrase uh, Zonker in the old Doonesbury comic, you know, even, even economists love chocolate chip cookies, you know. <laughs> so we pulled into Mrs. Fields, and you have to sort of picture this, these are, you know, well, I was going to say high-powered economists, but no, I don't know if there are high-powered economists. Anyway, they were a bunch of economists <laughs> huddled around a glass case with a clerk uh, pointing out cookies. And, uh, and she asked, well, how many would you like? And in unison, we said, how much are they? <laughs> we're well-trained economists. I can't tell you how many until I know how much they are. <laughs> If they're on sale today, we'll take the case. <laughs> you know, if, they, if they're full price, well, we'll have to pick and choose a little bit, you know. But we were so trained that that was the reaction, you know. Uh, and of course, when we tried to leave, we, we couldn't get out right away because uh, some diplomatic vehicles had pulled in to also come raid uh, uh, Mrs. Fields. But, but that's it. It's a very basic concept. And we do these things and don't recognize them always when we do them. Uh, these kinds of, of, this kind of knowledge is also helpful if you're trying to run a business. I recall some years ago a fellow who, who was trying to start a software business. And a lot of the young kids, they've got a mind to become the, the same, the, the new Gates or the same, uh, the new jobs, you know, with software. And this particular fellow developed a nice software product, but he, he priced it at $300 and he, he wasn't making any money. And so he remembered some basic lessons from an economics class. And so he just decided he wasn't making any money anyway. Software had next to no cost of production. So he just started lowering the price month by month. And he, he sold more and more product as he lowered the price. And he watched his revenue month by month. And he actually picked the month where he maximized revenue. And then he put the price there. So he was doing a direct application of demand theory in order to set the price for his product, and then it was very successful. It turned out the right price wasn't $300, it was $39.95. <laughs> you know, you can wish, right? But, but he was applying basic economics. 
Uh, on the supply side, uh, earlier this month we saw gas prices uh, spike 50 cents a gallon in California. Uh, what happened was there was a major refinery that went down and of course it reduced the, the supply of gasoline dramatically and uh, raised the price of gasoline. And just having a basic understanding of how supply and demand operate and their effect on prices makes those things uh, much, much clearer to understand. Um, last year at uh, the holiday season we, we were surprised here in our analysis to find that uh, uh, people were applying supply and demand analysis and uh, bunch of eBayers had gone out and cornered the market on a variety of critical toys. I'm going to call them critical because if you are six years old, they're critical to you apparently, and the parents don't want to hear all the noise. So anyway, uh, these eBayers bought out these toys, and they were selling on eBay at twice the manufacturer's suggested retail price, and they weren't available in the stores. So somebody had figured out if you can corner that, that market and control supply, then you can set prices and be a monopolist or something. You know? So uh, all these things apply, and understanding them allows you to function better in, in the everyday economy. Uh, these kind of principles also tell us things like that rent controls can lead to housing shortages and uh, minimum, wages, uh, minimum wage increases can, uh, can worsen uh, employment situations. And of course the Fed controls interest rates by controlling supply of money. So these are real basic things that are going to permeate everything you do in, in economics and finance. Uh, economics is also useful in uh, financing decisions, lease versus buy, considering a uh, mortgage or a car loan. I recently financed a new car at 0% uh, interest with a 2% uh, inflation rate. That means they're, they were paying me to, to take their money. Uh, and so I, I couldn't resist and uh, I took all I could get and of course that also allowed me to continue to collect interest and dividends, uh, profits on my, on my savings and uh, maximize my liquidity at the same time. Those are the basic decisions that people have to make and not, not all are capable of, of doing. For me it was a, wasn't a ch tough choice. It's very empowering to go to a a borrowing negotiation and actually know something about what you're doing. Uh, finance managers at car dealerships, they, they, they cringe when I come in, they find out I'm an economist, and I pull out my financial calculator and say, let's get to work. <laughs> I, mean, I, I had uh, one experience in which uh, uh, the dealer quoted me a, a price and said he can finance it at 4%, and so I said, well, give me the, give me the payments. He calculated them and I that's a 30% imputed interest rate. You told me 4%. Uh, no, I'm sure that, no, 30%. Well, I guess we included that loan insurance in the package. Uh, I didn't ask for that, did I? So let's take that out. He gave me a new number. That's still 11%. Uh, I said, well, I, I don't know. It's the computer, you know. I can't, I can't change that. I said, well, if you lower the price by $5,000, then you'll be back to giving me the deal that you promised me and you advertised all over the media. So if you aren't going to do that, then I think you have a problem. You know, they hate that, you know. Uh, but that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a two-sided negotiation. We're supposed to be talking to one another and they're trying to sell something and I'm trying to make sure I'm buying what I want to buy. In fact, I did a uh, a study for an attorney general's office in which they were trying to find a simpler way for s scoring leases uh, like, like automobile leases to help the public because they thought they were so complicated and after expending a lot of energy and not charging them because I'm not going to charge somebody for just talking you know but after we expended some energy on the on the case we finally decided that the best defense against these leases, understanding leases, is to understand leases, to understand how this actually works and make your decisions you know, based on that because they're too complicated to have a one-size-fits-all formula. But doing this kind of work requires understanding real versus nominal interest rates, the time value of money, amortizations, and liquidity constraints which are all in the area of, of economists. Um, Again, it's basic economics. If the current interest rate quoted by banks is 2% and the inflation rate's 3, then the real rate of interest is minus 1% and they're paying you to take money. And, and understanding that is critical. You're going to pay them back with cheaper dollars and so it, it, it makes sense to you. And we're in a situation now where there are a lot of negative interest rates. But that inflation thing that I mentioned is a, a core 
concept in economics, and it is also a cornerstone of the research of this institute, and I'll get back to that in a moment. Another subject area which is, which is key to economics, this may be the most profound thought in economics, and is not normally taught in finance classes, and that's the idea of opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the, the value of the highest valued alternative uh, that you forego when you make a choice. Okay? Uh, so the cost of something that you buy is not the dollars you paid for it, it's what else you could have bought with those dollars. And teaching this is, is really critical. Uh, if I buy this, I can't buy that. Well, unless, like the, the, the movie was saying, you just buy it anyway whether you can afford it. If you have a budget constraint, then you, you buy this means you can't buy that. And so you have to make decisions on this and you have to realize that taking this thing means foregoing this other thing. Uh, the concept of opportunity cost teaches students a lot about economic and, and financial decision making. Uh, opportunity cost looks more broadly at the, the problem as well. Uh, if you ask someone what, what's the cost of, of uh, going to college full time, Often they'll, they'll quote uh, the cost of tuition, books, and, and most often they'll even include the living expenses associated with going to college. But unless you have some rather peculiar plans, I suspect you were planning on living whether you went to college or not. So I wouldn't be including the living cost as a cost of going to college. I, I want to live anyway. Uh, I might live a little differently. I remember being in college and eating a lot of hot dogs and oatmeal, but you know, nonetheless, I was still living and expending money. Um, the, the, the other problem is that by going to college full time, you are also most likely not working full time. Some of us have tried it, it's a killer, but you know, most often the students are not working full time, which means they're also foregoing income to go to college. So the tuition you pay is also not being invested that money is lost to you, it's not being invested, so there's investment income as another cost. So in sorting out this, this college decision, you need to really weigh all these things, foregone income, how much money could I make now going forward with a the, with the career, and so on. It's a much more complicated decision than I think people give it credit for. Economists study the labor market and how it operates, and an understanding of this can be a, a huge benefit in making uh, decisions. Uh, your own employment decisions, uh, how you evaluate wage offers uh, in the face of regional and national cost of living factors and inflation risks. A as economists, we know that the current unemployment rate is 7.8 percent overall, which is not not good uh, for most people. Uh, we, to us, it's, we try to stick to the facts, but most people would find that to be an unacceptably high rate. But did you know that in 12 states the unemployment rate's below 6 percent? Now, if I was looking for a job, can you guess what states I'd be looking in? I mean, knowing that is a huge benefit in making some basic decisions and trying to find a job if you're unemployed. So that basic economic information is very useful. Uh, if you are over age 25 and have a college degree, your unemployment rate's 4.1%. So that most of the unemployment's for those who don't have degrees and who are less than age 25. So if you are under age 25 and unemployed and don't have a degree, that might be an argument to consider getting a college degree because you're going to do much better and uh, your, your job prospects at that age and that educational level are tough. So these help you make basic decisions, which are financial decisions in your life. Um, and then, of course, once you get the degree, you know what states to go to. Uh, it, it might be a, a rational decision to forego job hunting and get a degree if you're in those groups. Um, but again, you weigh these, these factors and you make your decisions in a rational way, uh, looking at cost and benefits. And once you get the degree, uh, you also might want to consider inflation risks and look at cost of living. Um, when, I was, uh, when I was living in Florida, I got a I got a job offer to come to Connecticut and I realized that the cost of living was higher and you can bet that played in my, my salary negotiations when I moved to Connecticut. Uh, when I was at the university, this is really odd, you know, sometimes I don't think university administrators really think about what they're doing. I'm sorry, I mean, I'm, I'm going to just tell you that outright. 
So I'm at the university, and they're asking me to go to Stanford. I'm at UConn, University of Connecticut. I'm an emeritus professor from UConn. Uh, I'm in Storrs, Connecticut, fairly low cost of living. And the uh, provost suggests, you know, he might like to see me go out to Stanford campus because they wanted to start a big financial program there and knew that my background would be good for that. So I looked it over and I came back to him and I said, yeah, I, I could do that. I'll have to have an 80% increase in my salary. <laughs> he looked at me like, you know, are you kidding me? It's a joke, right? Said, no, I looked at the cost of living in Stanford, Connecticut. And in fact, Stanford, Connecticut and, and uh, San Francisco, San Francisco Bay Area are the two highest cost of living places in the country. They kind of jump back and forth. It's like a competition. One year, one's first, the other one, the other first. Anyway, and I looked at uh, the cost of living, and, and it was going to cost me, uh, you know, something like 70% more just to live there. And I said, if you expect me to take on new responsibilities and stuff, you'll have to pay me even more. But it was a huge jump. And he said, we don't give cost of living differentials for locations. Why would you even think so? I said, you want me to do this because I'm an economist and I know about financial matters. What did you think I was going to do? <laughs> Hello? I'm an economist. Get you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we can get somebody from another department to go over. <laughs> but you need to know about cost of living in these areas, and they're very different. Uh, now, to operate effectively uh, in in this economy, you have to understand how the financial system operates. Um, you have to understand the value of financial intermediation and the many services that are available to households, to to businesses, to entrepreneurs. Uh, somehow bankers have gotten bad press uh, because of a few, like in every group of people, there are some, some bad ones, you know, but there are an awful lot of good bankers and bankers have a real interest in developing their communities. That's their, that's their livelihood. Uh, they make money by making loans. They make money by providing services. Uh, and they live and breathe in the same community that you do, especially the small town local banks, you know. So understanding how to work with your banker and what services are available is critical. So that has to be part of the educational process. We also need to know, uh, for example, uh, how the Fed operates and how it manages the banking system, how it creates money, and how money creates inflation. Um, as a financially educated person, you can understand the impact of policy on interest rates, on bond prices, uh, wages, inflation, you understand how, what, what the impact of policies are that are enacted, and you know how to adjust your financial position. It's your choice how you do that, what choices you make, depending on your own needs and preferences, but understanding those mechanisms, those linkages, that positive economics, that's what we do as an institute. We try to provide people with that information so that they can better make their decisions. But these are topics that are typically taught in a principles of economics class or in a money and banking class. And in fact, when I taught at the university, all the, all the finance majors had to come take my class. So they, they, they learned to, well, maybe they learned to hate me. I don't know. But uh, I think it was useful for them to do that. So inflation is a topic that keeps coming up. We keep talking about inflation, which is something that economists certainly study. Uh, it is uh, insidious. It is a, uh, a pervasive and hidden tax. Uh, measuring and understanding and predicting inflation is the business of economists. Uh, how do you measure it? There are many measures, uh, each of which seems to point in a different direction at times. Uh, we, we see quoted on the news the CPI, Consumer Price Index, but that's actually the CPIU. That's the CPI for, for urban uh, dwellers. And uh, there's also a CPIW, which is for wage earners, which is the one they actually just use to, to update the cost of living uh, increases for the Social Security Administration. So people look at one inflation rate, and then they, they get a cost of living based on another one. How nice, right? And by the way, cost of living in Social Security is, I, I think, for, mo for the most part, for the elderly. I mean, it is retirees, most of them. There's also disabled and others, but retirees. So there is a CPI for the elderly, but they don't use that one because the numbers are bigger and you'd have to pay more if you use that one. So understanding these different indexes and how they're measured and why they differ is very important. Um, 
having students develop their own price index for themselves is, is, a, is a great exercise. They get a kick out of it. I've seen some good ones, some chewing gum indexes and some, you know, Abercrombie clothes indexes and things like that. It's, but having to go through the exercise is important. And in fact, the Institute created its own price index. We had pub the public telling us, we, we talk to people. I call this economics by walking around. You know, there was a book uh, in search of excellence where they talked about management by walking around. Well, this is economics by walking around. We actually talk to people because it's a social science. Okay, it's about people. Anyway, and people told us that uh, their inflation experience didn't line up with what the government was telling them. And what they meant was, is that they, the inflation rate computed by the CPI wasn't what they seemed to experience. So we, we said, you know, sometimes people are right. Sometimes their perception is just off, but, you know, more often than not, they're right. Let's see if there's anything to this. And we created our own price index uh, based on the goods that you would commonly buy in a given week or month things that aren't contractually fixed. These are, the, these are the prices you actually experience, okay? We started with over 80,000 prices and we cut it down to like 37,000 because we took out, I don't buy a car every year, I don't think you do. Well, maybe some of you do, good for you. But anyway, we, we, uh, we put all these things into the index that were day-to-day -day prices and lo and behold, the inflation rate was about three times what uh, the CPI would suggest. The public was right. How about that? You know, people actually live and work in the economy, actually buy the goods, go to McDonald's, fill their car with gas. <laughs> they actually know what their prices look like. Okay? But that's part of what we do. But part of the importance of that is understanding that economic environment you're working in and understanding how to weigh your financial decisions based on actual effective uh, inflation rates. In, in fairness, the CPI was really designed to serve a little bit different function. So, I mean, I'm not trying to say that the DLS folks are trying to be, I don't know, malicious or whatever. They're, they're doing something different. And so, for example, they will correct the price of something like a, uh, like a, uh, uh, if you look at computers, you know, the prices have been plummeting, you know, and the computing power has been skyrocketing. So they actually correct the prices downward to reflect the increase in buying in, in computing power. Uh, they're trying to measure something else. But I don't get that luxury when I go to the store to buy one. I have to pay whatever the price is on the sticker, you know. So that's the kind of thing that, that we do is we're trying to bring this back to the public in a way they understand in terms that are meaningful to them. It's important to understand investments, real and nominal returns, pricing of assets, the effects of policy on markets, risk and diversification. Uh, speaking from experience, one of the keys to escaping poverty, or at least escaping from living paycheck to paycheck, is wealth accumulation. As you accumulate wealth and start to generate a return, uh, your financial foundation swells, you become less dependent on your, your paycheck, lots of things happen. Um, inflation is born of money creation. The expansion of mo the money supply often first affects uh, asset prices like uh, stocks and bonds. So if you are someone who likes to trade stocks and bonds, uh, which we don't do much of here, um, then, uh, then you want to understand how the Fed operates and how they're expanding the money supply and what the implications would be for those asset prices. Also, for example, currently interest rates are being held on the floor by the Federal Reserve. Now, bond prices can only rise if, if uh, interest rates fall. And currently, interest rates have virtually nowhere to go but, but up, which means that bond prices, the next move for bond prices will be down. So, you know, do you want to be buying bonds uh, when you know that the only direction they can go in price is, is down? I mean, these are basic elements based on understanding of the financial system, the money supply, Fed actions, and how investments operate. And students who have an understanding of that will, will do better in the world. My, my mother is uh, quite elderly. She now has uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but when she was a little sharper during the, uh, the financial crisis, too bad she didn't have it before the crisis, but she had her wits about her through the crisis. And uh, she called me one day and she was with her girlfriends, her 80-something-year-old 80, 80, 80 girlfriends, that's what she calls them. And she said they were having lunch and her friends were telling, them, telling her how they lost half of their, their, their life savings in the decline. And she was afraid that she had lost money too. I've been managing her money for a long, long time. 
And I said, well, Mom, you didn't lose anything. She was thrilled. I mean, at, at 87, she has a large portfolio. She lost no money in the crash, <laughs> which means now she's the head of the game. Uh, she has a good income from her investments. She has a pension and a, and a Social Security check, and uh, her house is paid off, and everyone should be so lucky. But that doesn't happen by accident, as you know. That happens from years of planning and working to make that right, making smart decisions, and making sure that she was positioned so that when something like a financial crisis occurs, she's not hurt by it. And that's the kind of thing we, we need to teach people. The housing market is an important market, as you know. Uh, people have to make decisions about renting versus, versus buying. People often think of housing as an investment, as a hedge against inflation, and so on. Uh, based, uh, based on my understanding of markets and economics, I sold my house at the top of the market. Um, and a lot of people, I'm sure, wish they had done the same. Being, being single and not really, I mean, I had no critical need to have a house. If you did, that's a different story. But I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, I don't have to ride this down. I think I'll just sell it. And I sold it before the, the crisis, before the decline. And now I have the, the money in the bank to invest. And uh, I'm in a much safer position. Um, that kind of basic understanding of markets and pricing and housing and mortgages and all the rest is, is, is very helpful. Our institute has done some economics uh, studies on real estate. There are a lot of things about home buying that, that should rightfully be considered. Uh, we found, uh, as we found out recently, of course, uh, owning a home can interfere with a job search. You can't get rid of your house to get, go take the new job. Uh, but although most Americans' wealth is tied up in their home equity, uh, it appears that home ownership is risky as an investment. Uh, prices don't always go up. They also go down, as we recently saw. And the housing market's only now starting to recover. While it can hedge against inflation, um, it, it does not provide uh, a continuous return. Um, also, most people who own a home have little in the way of other assets. So when we examine portfolio theory, we find that they have a totally non-diversified portfolio. All their wealth is in one highly risky asset. So as they experienced in the recent crisis, when the housing prices collapsed, everything they had invested went down because it was all in one place. All the eggs were in one basket. So how smart is that? Which is to say you don't, you don't necessarily buy all of the house you can try to manage to convince your banker to let you buy, you know, that you need to be a little more careful than that and be thinking about your whole portfolio of assets and how you manage those. Um, also, some, since the crisis, many uh, homeowners have discovered that banks or insurers may, may require them to put other investments into their, their property. They have to paint it, they have to put on a new roof or whatever. So homeowning is an expensive proposition, but again, as always, you weigh the cost and benefits, and it may be a, a good decision for some people, but they need to go into it with open eyes and a clear understanding of that decision in, in the face of all the others. And of course, one other important element to economic education is citizenship. Uh, understanding the policies and the economic consequences of the political process can be very useful. We, we stay out of the political process. You know, I, I've told people, and I, I sincerely mean this, we're not on the left, we're not on the right, we're not even on the spectrum. We just look at the numbers, here's what they are, here's the linkage between these things and the economy. Again, lead people, let people help them on their way, but don't choose the destination. We're just trying to figure out what the consequences of each sort of change in the economy would be. Uh, so that, that's actually a very comfortable place to be because I don't have to give advice, I don't have to get political, I don't have a degree in political science, my PhD is in economics, you know, so I don't, don't want to go there, you know. But uh, armed with this kind of economic reasoning, people are better able to sort out what policymakers are telling them. In fact, they might make better sense of some of these uh, debates that we've seen uh, in, in recent uh, weeks, uh, including the one on, on Monday. Um, but it's a basic background which, which helps you make sense of what's going on. And there are a lot of real concerns in the world that are affecting consumers and businesses and, and our futures. And, and uh, we'll be better educated, better able to participate in our, our uh, political system, uh, our responsibilities as citizens and so on if we have this kind of basic education. So, so this sort of thing is very far-reaching. That's the point I want to make. It, it, it's not just, oh, I got a better deal on a, 
on a car or I got a better rate on my, my, my loan. Those are very important things. Uh, when, a, when a family uh, doesn't get the best deal, they lose resources that they never get back. So, I mean, that's very important. But there's also this larger uh, national interest that, that we can think about as well. And I, and I know that you all embrace that. We're trying to make for a better society and a better America. And that's not just a platitude. It really isn't. It, when people understand these things, they will make better decisions. Business people will make better decisions. Households will make better decisions. We won't see the excesses that we saw that led to the last um, financial crisis. And uh, we'll, we'll choose our leaders better. So we're, we're uh, very enthusiastic about economics and, and uh, financial literacy, as you might, you might guess. Uh, and so again, I'm, I'm just so grateful that you take the time to come out and see us today. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Steve before we um, let him sit down and relax? <laughs> yes. yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm wondering about the presidential debate. You know, they're saying, oh, $7 trillion, you know, whatever the numbers are. Wouldn't it behoove us all to have, if not you folks, because you don't do politics, someone like you say, okay, we number crunch, we assess, you know, give us some deals that you're proposing you on a computer web page so you can all like think about it. And I, I understand that in Canada, the losing party continues to have this called like the national voice or something. Like they don't really disappear. <clears throat> they're, they're critiquing. There's always like another party critiquing, saying here are the numbers, this is not you know, lining up. Yeah, this is, uh, this is sort of like uh, when they have the State of the Union address and the other party gives their rebuttal or something like that. I mean, it's not a bad idea. Uh, again, we stay out of the, 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 the political uh, debate, but uh, we, we do try to provide information uh, about the economics, and, and it's, a, it's a delicate area for us. We make sure we don't slip into the, the political arena as we, as we do that. There are fact checkers now that, that go through these things and provide information, which I think is a very useful sort of thing. Uh, what we've tried to do in the past, and we're, we're still looking at these things and trying to figure out the best ways to do them, so I really appreciate this. But what we've done in the past is we try to take a problem and put it in the broadest context and, in, and inform the public about how this works, what the consequences are, uh, what, what leads to this, what, what, what develops from this, and so give them the tools to really understand what's going on there as opposed to just saying, like the fact checkers, well, <laughs> that number isn't right. You know, uh, we, we try to give them uh, a structure to let them understand uh, what, uh, what's, what's at work here, you know. Um, you know, for, for example, we, we did a, a thing recently where we looked at, um, we looked at tax receipts as a percent of GDP. And uh, it turns out that since World War II, uh, we have never been able to collect more than 20.9% uh, of uh, GDP in taxes. Okay? Mostly it's been under 20%. There was one year that it went to 20.9. Wow, you know, it's kind of a weird thing. But anyway, before that, other than that, one year, under 20%. Now, it, during that time, the, the federal income tax rates were as low as 28%, as high as 90%. 2%, highest marginal rates. And corporate taxes were all over the map. So we just kind of put that out there and, and made the, the comment that if you think you're going to change the tax rates, the, 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 the highest marginal tax rates on individuals or on corporations and somehow collect a lot more in tax revenue, unless you can show me how you're going to be different than every other year in the last 50 or 60 years. I don't know how you're going to do it. Which says that, of course, that one implication is, is that uh, raising taxes to balance the budget is going to be a tough go. So we, we provide that whole framework, that whole discussion, all that data, and just said, you know, here it is. Uh, and again, maybe you have a way to collect the taxes that we didn't in the past, okay. But you've got, you got to put that on the table, you know, that's all. 
Um, we do those kind of things. We provide that, that broader context. Um, we think that that's, that's useful. Uh, we, we've, we've done similar things with, uh, with, with other topics, but we're trying to provide some sort of a broader framework. Thank you. And just one more. Yes? Among other Western democracies, what is the percentage of taxes collected versus GDP? Well, this is an important thing, and we actually mentioned it in our, in our work, uh, that, uh, that that ability to collect taxes, actually what happens, as you can appreciate, is the higher the tax rates are, the greater incentives there are to find ways to hide income or to use tax shelters or whatever else, or even for, you know, postpone income and all varieties of things, right? Uh, so th the higher the tax rate, actually, the more you have to lose and the more you can afford to hire all the attorneys and accountants that you, you need to make that happen. Now, your incentive to do that changes with, with uh, actually it appears to be a cultural bias. Americans, you know, remember the Tea Party and all that stuff, uh, the original Tea Party, I don't know about the other Tea Party, but, but you know, the, the, we don't like taxes. And so there, in the American psyche, there seems to be this element of we don't want to pay more taxes. And so 20% is about what we get. Now, if you go to Sweden, for example, uh, they'll collect 60%. And, and that's fine. I mean, that's, that's something that their society accepts. Uh, they have a more homogeneous society. Uh, so there's different kinds of st structure to their economy. But that works for them, and that's, that's perfectly fine. So it's not as though it's some amazing rule of economics that applies everywhere and at all times. It's, it's very clearly uh, a cultural issue, and that may change. You know, that, that could possibly change, but it is, as it goes now, that's what we have. And of course, politicians know this. That's one of the reasons why uh, federal politicians have been pushing uh, the, the mandates down to the states, because they run out of money. And it turns out that Americans are much more accepting of taxes at the local and state level, probably because they can see the result. If you build me a road, wow, there's a road. It wasn't there before. They put up a new bridge. You know, they, they, they accept that more, so they're willing to pay more at the local <coughs> level because they see the return. There are these rational decision makers that we were talking about in economics. They see the return, they weigh the cost, they're more willing to go there. Yeah. Uh, here. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, I work at the Massachusetts Financial Education Collaborative, and it's important to us to look at all the socio-economic groups from rich to very, from very poor to very rich, because mm -hmm. there are bad decisions being made all across that spectrum. Uh, but one of the things that I've been thinking about personally is with the kids in particular, is are there substantial differences between middle class and wealthy children and young children? Um, in terms of the facts and how they benefit them. And I, and I don't know the answer to this and whether there's been research. So if you give these kinds of tips and understanding uh, on investment, on how money works, et cetera, to a kid whose parents have no education and no income, is there evidence, and I'm hoping that there is, so that's my bias, yeah. <laughs> that, that that can actually put them on a level playing field with middle class kids whose parents have assets to, to give them and things to, to help them out? Oh, absolutely. Um, it makes a huge difference. Uh, part, of the, part of the empowering process uh, is having people realize that they, they can actually do this, that they can actually make a difference in their own lives. I grew up in, in poverty. I grew up in a ghetto with a highly diverse, culturally diverse uh, neighborhood. And uh, we, we kidded later, uh, my brother and I, that uh, we were so dumb we didn't even suspect anything. You know, we, we didn't even know what the possibilities were. You know, we didn't know that there were programs that could help us to get through college or whatever. Uh, we just had no clue. And, and that's a lot of the, 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 the real tragedy of, of poverty is you just don't even have a clue. You don't even know that this is possible. You, you are led to assume that you're going to be in that same situation just like your parents and everybody before you. You know, you just don't get it. Uh, and, and, of course, the experience of people uh, varies quite a bit, whether or not they, as they learn, uh, are, they, are they also taught that they can, they, can, they can put that to work and they can actually succeed in this society. So that's really important. You need strong leadership, a lot of encouragement, uh, development, self-esteem. All those things are going to be critical to making that work. Uh, my family was very fortunate. We didn't have anything. We didn't know we didn't have anything. 
until much later, you know, a great family. Um, I was in Florida and we would come home from school and mom would say, hey, if you want to eat tonight, I'm serious, if you want to eat tonight, you better find some food. And so we had managed to scrape up pennies and bought some nets and my brother and I would go and we would cast net off of the beach, bring in fish and we had fish for dinner. You know, I mean, but we never thought that we weren't, you know, there wasn't a, a potential there to do something and our parents were very, very encouraging. They, uh, my father used to say that, that that helping hand you keep looking for is attached to the end of your own arm. <laughs> that was the sympathy I got, you know? No wonder I'm corrupted and an economist now, right? <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Um, we're going to break in a couple of minutes. Okay.